Hello, it's executive producer Dave Morris, and I wanted to pop in to let you know that the subject matter of this episode is of a sensitive nature and can be troubling to some, but Emily and I feel it's too important not to share during National Suicide Prevention Week. This is from an episode originally released in 2019, but it's definitely evergreen, and the information we're providing could save lives. A reminder, if you're contemplating suicide, help is available. Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. What is neurodiversity? What is it about these people? Dyslexia. Autism spectrum. ADHD. Gifted. Dysgraphia. All brains are different. It's okay to be who you are. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and today we'll be talking with Lisa Van Gamert from GiftedGuru.com about what we, parents and schools and mental health professionals, can do to detect and prevent the tragedy of suicide in high ability kids and teens. Throughout the interview, we'll be sharing reflections from a gifted young woman who talks about her struggle with suicidality. We originally planned to air her interview separately, but her reflections so closely mirrored Lisa's thoughts we decided to weave the two interviews together. Next up. I'm Lisa Van Gammer, and I am a gifted education person. I, my goal is to make the world safe for the gifted. I write about gifted parenting and education at giftedguru.com, and I'm the author of Perfectionism, A Practical Guide to Managing Never Good Enough and Living Gifted. Stay with us. Previously on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Hello, my name is Harry Thompson, and I am the author of The PDA Paradox. What is pathological demand avoidance? They will exhibit differences in communication, social interaction, and also uh, restricted and repetitive behaviors and interests. PDA is best understood, according to the literature, as an anxiety-driven need to remain in control. And I tell people, try not to get too hung up on the demand avoidance aspect, because then it will make understanding how the child's presentation can differ in school more difficult uh, to grasp. That's episode 54. Look for it wherever you get your podcasts. Last time, on the first installment of our series on suicide, we talked with Dr. Tracy Cross about the statistics, and he helped us to separate myth from reality. This week, we're happy to have Lisa Van Gamert with us, and today she joins us with advice on how to detect depression and suicidal ideation before it's too late, and how to guide our kids through the complicated landscape of depression. We feel like it's something that every parent should hear, and Lisa, we really appreciate you being here. I'm really excited to be here. I listened to the previous episode with Dr. Cross, and I was honored to be invited to be a part of this truly important discussion. In that first episode, we really focused on, you know, what does the research say? What do we know about suicide and high-ability kids? So our focus today is really going to be more on, so what do we do? What are the next steps? How do we, where do we go from here? Why don't we start off and maybe you can just tell us from your experience, what are some of the factors that really influence gifted kids experiencing depression? Well, I think that any time someone is different from the norm of the society in which they live, they're going to be vulnerable to feelings that are dysphoric. And gifted students know from a very young age that they're different. They recognize early on um, that they don't think the same as their peers necessarily. And I think that to me is where the vulnerability starts. And then it continues because they'll overthink it, right? Because they meta think, which normally a gifted student's meta thinking and their interest in meta thinking and that that they enjoy thinking about their thinking is positive, but it can be negative if it leads to obsession. Like, am I unhappy? Why am I so unhappy? I shouldn't be unhappy. Therefore, I'm more unhappy because I shouldn't be unhappy. And they start spiraling this over analysis drain. I think also because a lot of people believe that school is kind of the the purview of gifted children, that there's not a lot of support for their dysphoria vis-a-vis school. 
So they're unhappy at school, but nobody's interested in their unhappiness or listening to it. They sound like whiners if they're complaining about their experiences with school because everybody feels like, well, what are you talking about? School's built for you. It's so easy for you. You can get all A's. Not realizing that the gifted student often feels more disconnected from what's going on in a traditional school than even students who are on the opposite end of an IQ spectrum or who also have difficulty approaching the curriculum, but those difficulties are required to be supported by federal law. You mentioned about kind of that meta thinking, that process. And when you describe that, that's so accurate in what I hear from my clients. I mean, I remember I had a, a, I think he was in second or third grade at the time. He's much older now, but he was one of the first kids who I worked with who was a young child really dealing with that existential depression and figuring out like, what is my place in this world? Where do I fit? If it's this hard right now, how is it ever going to be easy? And, you know, that was really, really powerful for me to hear from him at that time. And that memory stays with me. But I think existential depression is a thing that Dr. Cross said, it's not always there, but when it is there, it's prevalent. Yes, I agree with what you've said. I think that What a lot of people don't understand is that while giftedness allows you ability to do what you want, it also inflicts an inability to avoid what you don't want as far as thinking. You can't turn it off. And so a gifted child, even a very young child, like you're talking about a second grader, we can see kids three or four years old. Um, I had a conversation one time with a kid in Mensa at a Mensa annual gathering, and I was running the gifted youth program. And this four-year-old said to me, it really bothers me that I can never be still. And I thought he meant that he struggled a little bit with the same ADHD-like behavior that all gifted kids almost all seem to exhibit. And I said, why do you think that is? And he said, well, because our planet even though it's in an orbit that's stable, the universe is constantly expanding. And so even if I sit down, I'm still moving. And I feel really tired because of that. <laughs> and I thought, oh boy, <laughs> right? And, and yet he goes to preschool and they're trying to teach him the letter S. Mm. So I'm not surprised that we have depression among gifted youth. I'm surprised we don't have more. Kids have these thoughts. And first of all, I think a lot of them don't verbalize them at all. And then if they do, parents and teachers or whomever is around, they don't know where to go with it. Let's say parents and teachers are watching for this. What are some of the things that they really need to look for? What are some of the signs of concern? First, you have to look for change. So some kids are just somewhat Eeyore-ish. And they're just kind of always that way, right? They can find the cloud in any sunny day. And so I don't think that parents of those children need to either A, try to turn them into Pollyanna or B, live in fear all the time because some of this is a bell curve of personality and some people are just naturally happier and some people are naturally less intensely happy, but that doesn't mean that they're in some kind of danger. So what we're looking for is knowing your child well enough to know the baseline of their personality and what's normal for them. And then look for changes in that. Are they much sadder than they normally are for a sustained period of time? Not a day, but a few weeks. I think it's just my facial expression and the way I stand and walk. Because people, my friends, and even sometimes strangers will just walk up to me and say I look depressed. Even my friend says that I like walk weirdly, like I walk like a robot because I'm like so self-conscious. And I guess I've always got this like face that doesn't look the happiest. (laughs) Look for transitions because there are moments where a child is going to be more vulnerable to those kinds of feelings, right? When they're moving from one school to another, if a friend, a very good friend moves away, if there's a divorce, if there's a death, if there is a catastrophic event in the country or the world, a lot of times 
because one of the hallmark traits of gifted children is early moral concern, then we have children who are more distressed by events in the world than a typical learner might be, but they often get shushed by adults. Oh, don't you don't need to worry about that, right? The adults are going to worry about that. But that doesn't make the child stop worrying. It just makes the child internalize the worry and then it eats them up from inside. So we watch for change. We watch for moments of transition. And this is not my original line, but I heard someone who I wish I remembered who it was now so I could give them full credit. But they said, we need adults at the crossroads ready to guide. So whenever you're able to greet your child, whether you're the one picking them up from school or when you get home from work, there needs to be some kind of pattern and habit of genuine conversation. Not just how was your day, but questions that are not necessarily predictable. If you ask the same question every day, the child can easily get into a rote pattern of response to you. So if parents can shake that up a little bit, and Atul Gawande talks about this in his book, Better. He talks about asking an unscripted question. So if you can, and he says that that's part of how you can become a positive deviant. Mm. And I like that idea. And so unscripted questions parents could ask could be, what was the thing that someone did at school today that most surprised you? Or what was something that you saw a teacher do that if they did that every day, it would make school better? What was something that you did today that you're hoping you can do again tomorrow? What's something that you saw today that happened that made someone else sad and would it have made you sad too? On a scale of one to 10, how happy would you be if tomorrow were just like today? Questions like that, that are designed to elicit more than, no, I don't have any homework or my day was fine. Those are the kinds of questions that are going to let parents see change in behavior. If you ask a question, if you say something like, on a scale of one to 10, how happy would you be if tomorrow were like today? And the kid says negative 10, then that lets you say a more specific question. And you can't just say, well, what happened that made it a bad day? Because of like nothing, right? You have to say specifically something like, what could have raised it from a negative number to a counting number, right? How do we get you out of integers? <laughs> or was it something that you did, something that you said, something that someone else did, or something else that someone else said that made the day less than ideal, right? Like asking more specific questions that still leave room for the student. A lot of times parents ask questions that don't leave room for the student. They ask questions that have a desired answer. So how was your day? Every kid over four knows that the desired answer is fine or good. We have to make it safe and normal to say, I said something stupid in class and everybody laughed at me and then I just couldn't get out of it all day. And now I'm embarrassed to go back to school tomorrow and not have the parent jump on top of that with, oh, it'll be fine. Because one of the things that propels gifted kids into existential depression is that they are able to understand that it isn't necessarily going to be fine. It could just as easily go horribly wrong. This could have been the first step toward global thermonuclear war in the <laughs> student's social environment. And so platitudes are the absolute worst thing that adults can do in working with gifted kids, because instantly that child will reject you as ignorant. Something I would add to that too, though, is also not trying to fix the problem. Sometimes the most powerful thing that a parent or a teacher can do is just listen. Many parents are uncomfortable in simply supporting children in sadness. We want them not to be sad. And yet, once they leave our home, they will have days of sadness. And if we send the message through, let me be a fixer, an unintended consequence of that is the message that any sadness must be immediately remedied. Mm. There must be intervention. And that, quote unquote, normal people have happy days every day. 
So that's another problem. Another thing that parents do sometimes to riff off of what you said is that not only do they want to fix it as far as telling the child what to do, but they want to intervene with the adults. A child has one bad day, one bad incident, and they're firing off this amygdala flared email demanding restitution. And (laughs) yet the adults may not have seen the thing because the child has in their own mind kind of blown it out of proportion. And if they're allowed to just work through those feelings, they'll naturally deflate and they'll be able to return to a, a more normal trajectory. And it might take a few days, but I think that we have to provide support in dealing with sadness in a way that respects the fact that you're allowed to be sad. Remembering that feelings and emotions are like waves. None of them are permanent. They're going to ebb and flow. Sometimes they're strong and sometimes they're weak. But some of the clients that I've worked with who sometimes we have the hardest time breaking out of some of that negative thinking and the depressive thoughts are the kids who feel like they should be happy. That just being okay isn't good enough. A lot of kids, especially high ability kids, right? You have a a good brain. You can figure out, oh, and they do figure out. I live in a time and a place of plenty. I have plenty of food. My parents love me. I have access to a good education. I have a bathroom inside my house. There's food on the table every day. I have clothes to wear. I should be happy. There are people who are in refugee camps. There are people in prison. There are people in poverty. And they they deserve to be sad. But I should always be happy. And if I'm not happy, I'm somehow ungrateful. Mm-hmm. And then they feel guilt about ingratitude. I remember I used to be just really worried and thinking, I thought that the fact that I used air that other people could be breathing, which sounds really stupid, but it just anything that I used up that other people could be using, it made me feel like, I don't know, that I was a burden. When I was working with my third grade, so I've taught third grade and I've taught high school and Um, working with third graders, I actually discussed this concept for the first time, the idea that chaos is the most beautiful order of all, and that anytime we try to impose order on chaos, we actually end up making things worse. And a lot of times I think that what leads to the kind of angst that we're discussing is this belief that if only there would be different choices made by people who had power to make these choices, then somehow we could resolve all of this. And so there's this this feeling of frustration that comes because why is there this injustice and why is there sadness and why are there bad things that happen? Not really thinking about the fact that whenever you have this many moving parts, billions of people living on a planet using billions of resources in in all kinds of cultures and all kinds of different climates and and different places, that it's a form of chaos. And that even though it seems like we should be able to fix the chaos to create kind of a utopia, every time you try to create utopia, you end up with dystopia. And if you can abandon the idea that there is some kind of earthly nirvana to be had and recognize that the fact that there are bad things that happen in the world doesn't make it a bad world. And it doesn't make you guilty for enjoying that world. It's an important distinction and it's an important message because I think that it can lead eventually to really dire thoughts. Like if you tell a kid when they're little, oh, you need to eat your dinner because there are starving children. And when I was a kid, it was China. I don't know what the country of the day (laughs) is now, but there are starving children in some other country. I remember thinking as maybe six years old, five years old, oh, maybe if I didn't eat, then those kids would have more food. So if we get kids super worried about everything going on in the world, it can lead to a belief that, I'm taking up resources and I'm taking up space and I'm hard on everybody and it would be easier for everybody else if I weren't here. 
I just want to save everyone, make everyone feel better so that no one feels sad again. They have food and shelter and everything is good for them. That just makes me really upset because I think of how I have that and how they don't. And I used to think that, how am I any more deserving of what I have than they have? A lot of our students who deal with suicidal ideation are not necessarily self-obsessed. Sometimes they're obsessed with the impact that they're having on people around them, especially because in teenagers, depression doesn't always manifest itself as sadness. It often manifests itself as persistent irritability. And then that gets on people's nerves in a way that, and ir because irritability does not trigger our helper response in the same way that sadness does. I think that's one of the things that gets missed. You know, one of those signs that we just don't even catch sometimes. I know that kids and teens are cranky. <laughs> Why are they, you know, on edge? And it's like, and first of all, there's some developmental piece to that, right? That's part of it, which also masks the concern. But ultimately, you know, I think that's probably the one thing, like if I could tell all parents and teachers who are on the lookout for signs of depression, recognizing that a change in mood, whatever that might be, and it might not be sadness, it might just be irritability, you know, it might be withdrawing, those are some of those subtle signs that say, oh, hang on, I need to look more into this. I think if I had a teenager at home now, my, my youngest just graduated from college this year, but if I had a teenager at home right now and I noticed any mood shift whatsoever, the first thing I would do, I, I would look to the smartphone. I would look to the social media. I would look to the research that's coming out on the effect on mood of smartphones and social media is absolutely shocking. And if somebody wants kind of a, like you don't have to read the peer reviewed journals. If you want a treatment of this, that's very readable and accessible, I recommend the book, The Hacking of the American Mind. In that book, um, the author explains pretty clearly the difference between looking for pleasure and looking for happiness and how so much of what our kids are involved in today is pleasure-seeking and pleasure-giving, but not happiness-giving. And that's dangerous. And I think we have to be more willing to proactively parent our teens. We're too often ready to just abdicate parenting to the idea that, oh, they're teenagers, you know, oh, they don't want, I, you know, what can I do? How can I control that? I don't have any control over that. And yet we have so much more control than, than we give ourselves credit for. And I'm not saying that a parent whose child is suffering with a mental illness is responsible for that mental illness. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that we're more powerful than we know in our ability to make a difference in the lives of our children and even their friends by being willing to confront things. So I have a good friend, one of my closest friends, and she has a son who's a junior in high school this year. Last year, she noticed that he had a mood shift and he's normally a pretty steady kid. And she said she noticed that every morning he was grumpy. He was snappy with his younger siblings. It was a shift, right? That's what we're talking about. We look for shifts. And so she said she just had a feeling that she needed to check his phone. And she saw that in the night, he was sending dozens of text messages through the night. They were innocuous. They were things like, yeah, I did my calculus homework. You know, there wasn't anything wrong with the text. But the fact was his interrupted sleep was causing him huge problems. And so she said, that phone is not going to be in your room anymore and got him an actual alarm clock. I know it's crazy, but we have more power. And sometimes the interventions are simple. I think a lot of times parents don't want to intervene or don't know what to do because they feel like it's going to take something that's far beyond their expertise. And yet often it's a simple matter of conversation and of confrontation of things that might not be to their best advantage, making sure that their diet is good, making sure that they're getting exercise, making sure that they're getting vitamin N, which is nature, right? making sure that they're getting outside. All of these things that we know lead to 
more positive mental health. All of these are things that parents can influence their children. You know, you mentioned that parent who looked through their child's phone. And, you know, Dr. Cross said something about that in his episode, too, about unbridled journaling, I think, is the phrase that he used. What do you think is an appropriate level of privacy for kids? And how can parents find that balance? I think all I can speak to really is the way that we have parented our children. And I have a lot of parenting experience. I have three children of my own. We've had two foreign exchange students and 12 foster children. In our home, the rule has been there is no expectation of privacy. Because, and this is the key, you have to connect why you're doing what you're doing to what you're trying to accomplish as a family. Parents who are worried about invading their children's privacy or offending them by violating their privacy, that's not really the issue. They're worried about the wrong thing. What they have to do is convey to the child, what is it that this family is all about? And when they can convey to the child what the family is all about, then the child is more able to see, not that they won't get frustrated in the moment, but more able to see that a parent looking through the phone, looking in a journal, talking with other people, that that is aligned with what you're trying to accomplish as a family. Now, every family will have its own goals, depending on are they in a faith tradition? Are they focused on a child's academic success? Whatever it is that you're hoping for as a family. And one of our goals as a family was that everybody would come out of the home as happy and open to opportunity as they came in it. In order for that to happen, I have to know what's going on with you. And so nothing with an internet connection was allowed anywhere other than the common areas of the home. They weren't allowed to have tablets or computers or anything in their room that had an internet connection. And every now and then, I would just hold out my hand, you know, hand me your phone. I just scroll through like, and I'm not really worried about what my kid is doing. And, and my kids know that. I'm worried about the messages being sent to them. And I think one of the ways that parents can dial back kids from being worried about those invasions of privacy is that they handle it correctly when something upsetting or distressing appears. What do you do, right? So you notice it, you know, you say, well, I noticed that so-and-so texted you a picture of herself and I noticed that she didn't have as many clothes on as maybe she would have if she'd come and knocked on our door, right? So what did you think about that? Like, what did you think when that came through your phone? Do you think it would be appropriate to remind her that your mom sometimes looks at your phone, right? And so a lot of times the kids are looking for help, but no teenager is going to say to a parent, I really want you to look through my phone because stuff is coming up on Instagram or Snapchat and it's really hurting me, but you're not seeing it. No kid is going to do that. And whenever I think about the question of privacy, I think about the boys who devastated Columbine because the only reason that that was able to happen was because they operated in privacy. They were in the basement parents don't know what they're doing. And I'm not criticizing those parents. I think that that incident, that horrible tragedy, opened our minds to the fact that kids go very dark places and that without parental intervention, they can get down paths that are absolutely horrific and sometimes fatal. One of the issues that we have with kids is that we think that only younger kids need supervision. Oh, by the time they're 11 or 12, they can stay home by themselves. The fact is, I think a lot of eight and nine year olds can do a lot better at home by themselves than 15 and 16 year olds. I don't think it's wise to leave teenagers unsupervised. Whether they, you know, if they're at work, if they're at school, that's great. But long periods of time without guidance of some kind without knowing that somebody cares about where I am right now is really dangerous. We've talked about the family and the home dynamic, but do the same strategies apply to the teacher-student relationship? In some cases, yes, but it's definitely a different dynamic at school. Let's talk about how. 
a lot of the same techniques that work for parents work for teachers. Look for changes, watch for transitions, listen to kids, be proactive in asking questions, and be willing to seek help from someone qualified to help when you notice something different. The most important thing for schools is you cannot wait until a student attempts or completes a suicide to have a plan. You have to have a plan and you have to convey it because if the stakeholders don't know what the plan is for if a suicide happens, then all of the feelings come up and then there's a lot of opportunity for the parents of, in the family to be offended and hurt and it can tear an entire community apart. Schools have to have a plan ahead of time and there are resources for schools and how to develop these kinds of plans, but they have to decide things like, are we going to allow memorials? And if so, what kind and for how long? Are we going to allow things to be planted? How are we going to handle, like trees, how are we going to handle the yearbook? What are we going to say to the rest of the parents? What are we going to do, right? And when those things are spelled out ahead of time and everybody knows, and everybody knows we're not going to treat a death by suicide differently from a car accident other than we're going to focus on mental health. And there are lots of proactive things that schools can do. They can just create the conversation, having suicide prevention posters in the hallway. Um, there are a wide array of them appropriate for all kinds of levels of student. Uh, we can make sure that in our school information that goes home with students, that the suicide prevention hotline phone numbers are in there, that the students on the campus are well aware of which people are trained in suicide prevention and who students should go to if they're worried. It will decrease the amount of worry that students have about tattling if they know, oh, Mr. So-and-so and, -so and Miss So-and-so are the people who handle it when we're worried that our friend might hurt themselves. And teachers need to use the words when, not if. Schools and teachers use the words when, not if. When you have a friend who's talking about hurting themselves or talking about suicide or talking about wishing that they weren't here anymore, how do you handle that? Or what do you think you should do? Instead of saying, if that ever happened. Because when you say when that happens, you open the door to normalize it further. And that must be done. So bottom line, schools must have a plan and they must normalize the discussion about suicide. You cannot pretend that it isn't a thing. But at the same time, you cannot allow it to be glorified. There's this tendency in our society that when someone completes a suicide, all of a sudden, everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon of I'm that person's best friend. You see it among celebrities in Twitter. You see it all over the place. And that's a very dangerous thing that leads to contagion. So schools have to be ready to intervene and shut that down. Schools should not allow memorial services to be held on the campus. The school should not be associated with the suicide, meaning that when kids show up to campus, they can't have a memory of, oh, this is where I sat in the memorial when so-and-so killed himself. That needs to take place outside of school. Teachers should rearrange the classroom seating assignments and rearrange the desks if they can about five days after the memorial service. Little practical things like that prevent it from being that this desk is so-and-so's desk and it sits empty and every time we sit there, we're thinking about it. So talking about that peer influence and those friends, you know, I do think that sometimes we also forget that kids are on the front lines of handling depression. You know, they're the ones who know if their friends are cutting or talking about suicide. What can we do to help kids be prepared to handle this situation? One of the difficulties in helping kids handle situations with peers is that we have a culture that opposes what we would call tattling. And so kids feel that it's tattling or my husband's Australian, they call it a dibber dauber <laughs> instead of a tattletale. And they'll say, I'm going to daub on you. <laughs> but even, well, daub on you. <laughs> even though they say it cool, it has the same negative connotation. And I think we have to, at very young ages, we have to send the message to kids. If you are sharing with an adult something that 
is to help someone else, that's not tattling, that's saving. And we have to celebrate it. So I think it's hard as parents because there is nothing, well, I was going to say there's nothing more annoying than constantly having your kids come to you and complain and complain and complain, but there's plenty more annoying than that. <laughs> there's so many things that are annoying, but, but definitely, definitely, if you have children, you are dealing with them coming and tattling and complaining. And it becomes very easy to tune it out and to, to try to just tell them to go away. Or, or you'll hear parents say, is there blood, right? Like as if there isn't physical harm, then there's no harm done. And that is something we have to try our hardest to combat in ourselves. And I think the times that we're most vulnerable, we have to recognize. So I know for a lot of parents, there's this shark hour, right? Like they come home from work, they're trying to make dinner. Everybody's bringing you pieces of paper from school that need to be signed right now. And oh, by the way, I need a poster board and two dozen cupcakes for tomorrow. And it feels to the parent like just everybody wants a piece of you. And the very last thing that you have time and mental energy for is a kid saying, and so-and-so's crying and blah, 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 you know, and your inclination is just to say, well, is anybody bleeding? Not necessarily understanding that the most dangerous cuts are internal. Mm -hmm. The most dangerous cuts are the cuts on the heart. So we can ask kids, we can be proactive. We don't have to wait till our kids come to us and tell us, you know, I'm worried about so-and-so. We can ask them, which of your friends are you most worried about right now? Which of your friends do you feel like when you hear bad news or when you hear on the news that somebody completed a suicide, which of your friends do you worry about? Because it goes back to that same pattern of asking that I mentioned earlier. We can't wait for our kids to bring the concerns to us. We have to be proactive in asking them, who do you think your saddest friend is? Which of your friends do you think has the most difficult relationship with their parents? If one of your friends would say, I would give anything to live in your house, who would it be? We learn a lot and maybe we can't approach that parent, but you can, as a parent, call the school counselor and say, I'm concerned because of things that I'm hearing about this child and I don't have a relationship with the parent that enables me to contact that parent but I'm letting you know there's a problem because that counselor is a mandatory reporter so that counselor has to investigate it their licensure requires it their certifications through school require it and it's not only that it's a requirement they want to help and they know how to do it and they're tapped into resources you don't have to be a counselor you don't have to be a licensed clinical social worker or a licensed professional counselor to make a difference in the lives of kids. You make a difference in the lives of kids by being interested in kids, by being willing to listen to kids, and being willing to act with careful consideration on the information that they give you and to respect that they know what's going on. And that just like you notice differences in them, they notice differences in their peers. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for your time today. I think that this was a really great conversation. It'll be really helpful for people who are looking out for those kids. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for this series that you're doing because we have to talk about it. We have to talk about the small changes that we can all do that add up to a big difference. The thing that like really was a game changer for me was my medicine. And everything just changed after I got on this one pill. And then after that, things slowly started getting better. And I started taking suggestions from people, like they would tell me things that I should try doing to feel better. And I tried it and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Kind of scary at first, cause I didn't know if it would work or not. And if I knew if it didn't, then I would be up really upset. But when it did work, it was kind of relieving to know that I had something that I could do to feel better. We 
we'll visit this subject one last time in a special interview with someone who understands the risk and the weight of suicide intimately, a parent who has lost her gifted son to suicide. The best way to remove the stigma surrounding a topic is to shine a light on it. For too long, depression has been shrouded with suspicion and seen as a character flaw or a weakness, misunderstood by those who think people dealing with it should just be able to toughen up or fake it till they make it. But you know, that really only goes so far. Vulnerability requires strength, and not just from the person who is asking for help. Vulnerability is also required from the people who want to help them. We have to confront our own fears about this topic so we can really hear what people are saying. Once we're aware of our own beliefs and biases, we can make sure that we just don't dismiss the teenager who suddenly seems more surly than usual as just going through a phase. We have one thing going for us that kids and teens don't. We've lived a life that has had its ups and downs, and we know that things do get better. That's the hope we offer when we open up a conversation with someone who is struggling, when we take a deep breath and ask the hard questions, and when we stay as long as needed, even if it's just to listen. If you're looking for some kind of sign that you should stick it out, this is it. Suicide Prevention Hotline is one 800 273 8255. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. Thanks for listening. Won't you save, 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 save me? Won't you save, 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 save me? Won't you save, 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 save? Save me, save, save me. This episode was originally published September 4th, 2019. September is Suicide Awareness Month. It's not a subject to be afraid of. Check on a friend or neighbor or family member today and think of the difference that that few minutes might make. The Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 800-273-8255 and is available 24 hours every day. Our thanks to Lisa Van Gemmert. If you'd like to know more about her and her work, check the episode page at neurodiversitypodcast.com. I'm Dave Morris, and for Emily, thanks for listening. This podcast is a production of Morris Creative Services.